My name is Dirk Westervelt. I'm one of three editors on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Actually, there were four of us because there's also our additional editor, John Barry, and then Andrew Buckland and Mike McCusker and myself that were picture editors on the on the movie. Um, and we're going to go through our timelines a bit. Let's start with the whole movie. So what you're looking at now is the whole movie, and this is fairly close to the end of the process. So some of the stuff in the production layers has been, you know, cleaned up or there would have been even more layers or layers of, of cost production. Um, you can see a lot of green, which is, is our VFX shots coming in. Um, once they are final, they turn purple and you'll see uh, that better when we go to look at a reel. Below that, generally you have about seven production layers and including ADR and uh, group tracks down to seven. And then at eight, that's a dialogue stem. So that's something we would have gotten back from the sound department uh, generally after after a mix or at certain points in the process. Walla split out on nine. So we've got, you know, dialogue that's been been cleaned up there on eight, on eight and nine. And below that, we get into effects. And that uh, effects stuff is still a lot of broken out stuff, but most of this color stuff will have been stuff that we would have gotten at certain points from the sound department. Sometimes it came in as just stems and we would go through and also use a tool in the Avid that will get rid of anything where there isn't any audio. So the, the blank spaces within it, you know, if we get a stem for the, the whole reel, would go out and automatically delete portions where there isn't anything going on so that we have more empty track space to work with as we're juggling around and recutting with those tracks. Tracks probably would have come in as stems and then been cleaned out that way. And then sometimes as we're we're recutting, we'll be moving those around and overlapping them in in different ways to keep the effects working with the new cuts. That goldenrod stuff on 10 through 16 is mainly kind of fully and hard effects. And then you've got those effects tracks 5.1 that are on 17 and 18. The yellow stuff above that is a mix of, of mono and stereo, depending on where we want to put it. And then you've got usually a background track down there as well, which is on 19, the dark purple stuff, and some of, sometimes going into 20. And that's, again, it's just when we're recutting and we're moving stuff around. Blue stuff at the bottom is music. Usually I have like a light blue sometimes for temp and then you know, a darker blue for stuff that, that comes in later um, or source and and uh score actually it's more likely that the light blue stuff is temp and then the score is the dark blue stuff and you see that in our movie there's quite a lot of score and not as much source at the very top of the timeline you can see those clips on v9 are subtitles and you see a lot more of them at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie because that's where we have foreign language so in 1944 and kind of real one and the the beginning of real two it's a lot of uh, german so that's a lot of those subtitles there and at the end of the movie when we go back to syracuse 2000 years ago um, those translations and so there's a bunch of subtitles there at the end as well on those upper tracks so that's a bird's eye view on the whole movie Okay, so this is real one, and this is also at a later state. It's uh, even further along than what we were just looking at. The production tracks are on uh, one through seven, the same way. We have that dialogue stem on eight. So in this case, it looks like the reel hasn't been touched since the dialogue stem came in. So we would actually mute all that stuff on one through seven because it should be represented in that stem on eight. So if you switch to the muted version, you can see that stuff go off. So that's what it would look like, you know, with those tracks on one through seven muted with the dialogue stem just active. And that's what it would be working. And then if we make changes, we might mute a section of the stem and go back to the production stuff because we'll have more control of that and moving clips around. Then you see solid stems for effects down below with the yellow kind of fully hard effects and then 5-1 effects stem, the rust color and the purple is backgrounds in 5.1. There's a complete music stem down there at this point in 5.1 at the bottom. And then if we look at the top again, you'll see those subtitles. So this being real one, because there's a lot of German spoken, there's quite a number of subtitles. And in some cases there are three and four, and that's because we had alternates. Mostly, you know, Mike was working in this section and working with Jim 
a lot and they were sort of still finalizing what exactly is the translation of this or line going to be. And they were keeping those alts in the timeline sometimes that they were still making those decisions. So you can see that the top ones on V12, just below that filler subcap layer are active and everything below that is muted. But this way, by keeping it in the timeline, they could kind of quickly switch around between alts that they were considering as they made different decisions on, on different days on those. And if you looked at an earlier timeline from much earlier in our process, you might see even muted production clips down in the timeline or more of them. I personally carry alts within my timeline. I don't think Drew or Mike really do that. They keep them in, in separate bins. So it's just slightly different ways of working. Usually when we're all working together, I try to clean mine out when the, when the spreels go into the bin. But sometimes, you know, just certain sections that I'll be working on, I might have like a bunch of muted alts either on, on top or underneath the production clips on the timeline. And that isn't really visible here because we're further along in the process. So that kind of stuff would have been cleaned out. But you see our original camera negative is on track one, um, sometimes with an effect on it or in, in some cases collapsed even, and there'll be like layered effects in there. We do a lot of splits. I think all of us, Mike and Drew and I probably tend to do a lot of, lot of splits where we're taking the performance on one side and from one actor perhaps and perhaps another actor, a different portion of the take just to kind of make the timing work within context. So that'll be in some of those collapsed tracks. Then the colored clips, when we start going into the green, and we spoke about it before, we we're in the whole the whole movie timeline, but here you can see it better. Those green tracks or VFX shots as they come in, and we'll keep a certain number of versions now. And some of these, we might have gotten 100 versions over the course of the process. We don't keep that many, but we'll keep, you know, three or four or five of the last two, depending on the shot. And then the purple one means that it's been final. So that's a final VFX shot. And then... Depending on the shot, you can see in some cases here, we've still kept versions before just in case something maybe comes up later or maybe it was a CBB, like it could be better shot. So there, there was something still informing us about those prior versions. We've kept them in the timeline. But in some cases, you'll see there's only a purple shot and there probably used to be other versions that were green there before, but we've committed to those shots and just uh, deleted the green versions from the timeline. I mean, you can see this thrill is pretty complete because almost every shot has a purple final VFX on it. And you can also see the percentage of shots that were visual effects shots in the movie sort of roughly because there are very few that don't have a green or a purple clip on top of it where it's actually original camera negative. There's a couple there uh, towards the beginning of the reel, but there's really not too many. And this is 1944, so the de-aging and everything, there was, you know, especially a, a large number of shots, but uh, I think you see that's fairly consistent even in the rest of the movie, the vast majority of our shots were VFX shots. You can see there's a white stem in there and the stuff that's still active here where we haven't got the production tracks muted. There's also a white stem in there, which would have been from previous temp mixes where we've cut it up and moved it around as we are recutting the movie after screenings and things. So this would have been right after we got a temp mix back. So we've got the stem in there on track eight but those white clips on four through six for example are pieces of a stem that we would have gotten back from a prior mix where we've cut those up and worked with them as we made changes to the movie before we did the next mix and then once we get that next mix back we would mute those tracks and the process begins again but we keep those in the timeline so that we always have access to our production tracks as we're recutting and uh, can you know fleetly get back to, to moving stuff around as we need to. So with the color coding on the markers, we divvy out at the beginning, like every editor might have a specific color that's just sort of grabbing their selects. And we make sure that we have different ones each for that. So we know this one's Drew's, that one's Mike's, or this one's mine. The blue stuff is all VFX. John will put those on uh, when a shot's been turned over. And John uses cyan markers when the shot has been turned over, and then they turn this dark blue when the shot's been finaled. We try to keep our main production tracks on one through four, but sometimes we go into five or six. You can see that there's a lot of white clips and it bleeds over from, you know, might try to keep those on five and six, but they might bleed into four too if we need a little more room. 
those are those pieces from previous mixed stems. Once we cut them up and we're, we're moving them around as we're recutting the movie. You also see orange and kind of pink shots in the picture timeline. Those are previs and temp shots that we might do in-house. Our VFX editors do some stuff in-house. Those will be in, represented by those colors and, and the biz that we're getting in. The pre-visualization clips that we get in are uh, represented by those colors as well. We don't generally label our video tracks, and that's because everything is quite fluid there. You know, we never know how high the visual effects are going to go, how many layers a thing is going to be, or how many production layers we might want to keep active underneath. So that can change in the course of the process that we might want to raise or lower, like those subtitle layers, for example. We like to keep those on top so they're separate, but if we end up wanting more video tracks, like you can see here that there's that one peak in the middle where the visual effects shots went up high enough they wanted to keep that many online, probably because it was a complicated shot and they were informed by all those prior versions. But you actually have the visual effects there overlapping into the subtitle tracks. So if we had called that, you know, subtitle track or something, it would already be wrong because there's also visual effects in there. But if we went higher in a bunch of places, we might want to actually raise the subtitle tracks. Now we've got to relabel them. So we're all kind of aware of where clips are going. So we don't really need to label those those video tracks. The audio track, on the other hand, it, it helps us there to to label those. So you can see that we're we're labeled there with dialogue and effects tracks, music and so on. And also you can see, you know, some are label five one. Now we're looking again at the master timeline of the whole movie, and you can see some things in this kind of bird's eye view of it. One is, again, the subtitles on the left and the right side on those upper layers. Uh, that's because the first part of the movie is Germany, so there's a lot of German that's being translated. At the end, they go 2,000 years back to Syracuse, so that's what those, those clips are doing up there is translating that. Uh, you kind of see how much action is going on where the quicker cutting is by where those areas go black because there's so many clips. So you can see in the beginning, there's there's a good amount of black. That's the uh, the train sequence. And that area there is going to be kind of the most action-packed part of the train sequence in 1944. Then in the middle section, that's the tuk-tuk chase, probably that, that longer section right there of, of black that shows up. Before that is the parade. So between those two sections is the parade in New York. All of that black is indicating the quick cutting and the action in that part of the movie. A little later, that little black section just to the right of, of the part that we probably identify as Morocco is the uh, probably the underwater dive, something in that area. Then if we go further to the end of the movie, it gets pretty dark again, and that's the third act. You've got a lot of action going on. There's also that Assassin's Creed clip at the end there, that long clip. That is a dummy credit sequence that we just lifted from another movie. Uh, sometimes when we, we're mocking it up for a screening or something, just to kind of feel what it's like to, to go into a credit sequence at the end, we might you know, just grab something that, that's, that's handy from another movie and cut that on there just to, just to get the feel of a credit roll starting at the end of the movie. So this is a, a very late in the process version of the whole movie. And what we're looking at is the original camera negative reduced to V1 and V2. There's a couple places where they still needed to be in two tracks. There's other places where you've got multiple video tracks collapsed down into V1. But it's... Every, the whole movie is reduced down into two tracks of original camera negative. So that's our original dailies on those two tracks. And V3 has all of the VFX shots. So this is a, a kind of a final sort of cleaned up DI turnover version of the movie where you've got all the, all the videos really on those three tracks uh, with all the visual effects on V3 and all production footage reduced to V1 and V2. Uh, that stuff at the top still is still subtitles that we're carrying as well. 
So that's been collapsed down to its simplest form, basically. And you can still see where all those black marks are, where those black sections uh, appear, where there's just a lot of a lot of cutting in the action portions of the movie. We do a lot of keyframing in the audio. Donald Sylvester is the sound supervisor has been working with Jim for a long time and we're very fortunate to have him on early in this process to uh, be delivering sound to us as we're as we're going and it makes all the difference in the world so that's represented in a lot of the the sound work that's that you see there so these timelines represent a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny I hope everybody gets a chance to see the movie and enjoys it <laughs>